Welcome, listener. This is Sebastian Nothwell here today talking with Carolina Cruz. Hello. Hello, that's me. It is you, and we're so glad it is. Yay. Here today to talk about the horror romance, Blood in the Water. One of my favorites. People kept asking me at the convention I was tabled at this weekend, which of my books was my favorite. And I started just answering Blood in the Water because it's the one I'm thinking the most about. And people don't understand the writer conundrum of, what do you mean, my favorite? Don't make me choose. So sure, it's my favorite. So Blood in the Water is a horror romance novella with the premise of two people trapped on a ship. One is a vampire, the other one isn't. And it opens, dare I say, with a bang. I would say that that is (laughs) something you could say that is true about this story. (laughs) It opens. With a man. With our human protagonist shooting the vampire in the head over and over again every single night. Mm-hmm. I have to applaud a horror character who has a strong, smart strategy from the jump. Yes, she does. Uh, too bad that she um, is weak of heart by the end. Or she probably could have just kept doing that forever. I mean, you run out of powder at some point. That is true. She has plans for that, though. Uh, Those (laughs) plans are not so bright and shiny. Oh, no. My poor girl. Poor Carmen. Poor Carmen. But what inspired you to write this story? So there are three main inspirations for this that I can point to pretty directly. Okay, there are four. There are four. Uh, (laughs) um, The first is the obvious. Last year, I went and saw The Last Voyage of the Demeter in theaters. And for people who are not familiar with Dracula, there is a section of the book where Dracula gets on a boat and... While on that boat, he kills literally everyone on that boat. And then the boat rolls up to harbor with nobody in it at all. And it's this big mystery that is only kind of unveiled through the captain's log. Very fun. So when they were doing a movie adaptation of this section, it's like, that sounds really exciting and fun. The only problem is um, they fucked it up. So... (laughs) (laughs) Ain't that always the way? It made me so mad because the whole exciting point of this like part of the story is that nobody lives and an empty ship shows up and that's such a cool like mystery. And then the movie had a character look at the screen, look at the camera basically and be like, I am a very cool and important person and I have a deep and important internal life. And I'm like, ah, damn, (laughs) this guy's not dying. (laughs) God damn it. And sure enough, he didn't. Um, And that pissed me off to no end. And I was like, well, we could have had such an interesting story here. So that was the first one was like, I was like, I have to do something interesting with this premise. I'm intrigued by this premise and I'm unsatisfied, Um, which is similar to how I felt about a movie that came out in 2016 called Passengers, which stars Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence and is about two people being woken up from cryo sleep on their spaceship a long time before they're supposed to. Except that, that synopsis is slightly disingenuous, what actually happens is that Chris Pratt wakes up, and then after, I think, like, five years, which is maddening, he makes the conscious decision to wake Jennifer Lawrence's character up because he's formed a one-sided romantic relationship with her through watching her, like, story over video feed. And then he lies to her in order to form a romantic relationship with her in real life, under false pretenses. So that also was kind of ick and gross. And I'm like, that's another interesting premise that you have just wasted. So that was another inspiration was like, there's so much tension, especially if one of the people is dangerous and there's sort of a psychological horror aspect to it. But I didn't want to do the like weird predator thing they were doing with Chris Pratt. The third inspiration is a short from one of the VHS anthologies called Terror. Not that terror, a different terror. (laughs) So this doesn't count as a terror mention. (laughs) Terror is about a kind of white supremacist sect in like Colorado or something. I don't remember. They're in one of the states and they are going to blow up a government building because they have captured a vampire and found out that his blood explodes when it is exposed to sunlight. Oh my God. And their solution to keeping him contained is that they shoot him in the head every morning (gasps) or every at nightfall every night to keep him still until daylight when he can't move around. And once again, I think that short operated perfectly on its premise. It was really interesting to me, but I was like, there is something really interesting to me about the premise that I think would mesh with these other things. So, and then the last one's alien because, you know, monster on a ship with one woman with a gun is alien. So there it is. 
That's why Carmen's name is Cortez Weaver. She is named after Sigourney Weaver. Oh my god. I mean, at the end of the day, aren't we all just trying to remake Alien? I can't argue with that, honestly. It's the perfect story. Is this not the truth universally acknowledged that Jane Austen (laughs) spoke of? You know, I think that's what she was talking about. She didn't know it yet. I think she saw, she had a vision of Sigourney Weaver in a tank top. I was like, damn. (laughs) I gotta write this down. I have to write this down right now. Speaking of the blend of horror and romance. Oh, yes. <laughs> how did you balance those in this story? It was really, to me, kind of distributing where the horror comes from. Because early on, a lot of the gore and the like stuff that would maybe make this not just a straight like romance with a vampire comes from what Carmen is doing to Court and also the threat of what he might do to her. And because of that, I think that brings with it an inherent romantic tension where it's like, I think Court goes over this in his internal monologue because he's a very romantic person in, in general and a very like overthinking person. He's a real soft boy, he is. He is a, such a soft boy. But it, there's this kind of... Yeah, this tension to the person who is technically in the most danger and has the least inherent way to protect themselves being the one who is doing the most damage through most of the story. And then that starts to turn into Court letting this damage be done because he understands the horror of what he is and what he represents to her. And he starts to view it differently and view himself differently in regards to her. And when he understands that and the danger he poses to her, that's when it starts to turn into a romance. So it's kind of they're intertwined, you know? If that makes sense. It does, yeah. Kind of that building of trust by mutually acknowledging the absolute dog shit situation they're in. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then once that happens, the horror becomes more external and more focused on the situation that they're in and less on court as a threat and more on, oh shit, now that you're not the threat, we have to worry about the fact that, you know, there's a storm or we are running out of food and shit sucks. I did really appreciate the moment where Carmen comes down and announces that there's a storm. It had a real Moon's Haunted vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, that's very much the vibes. <laughs> what? Moon's haunted. <laughs> Grabs a gun. Moon's haunted. Grabs a musket. Storm's coming. <laughs> You're a sailor. You deal with it. He's like, God, I guess that's true. Okay. <laughs> So this novella originally appeared in a serialized format. How did you find the experience of writing serialized fiction compared to your other, I would say, more traditionally released novels? I think the pacing ended up being very different as well as how long the chapters were. The reason I published this serially is because it is partially inspired by Penny Dreadful, specifically by um, Sweeney Todd and the String of Pearls, which is my favorite book ever. I mentioned this on my introductory episode of this podcast. But um, that's why I went with a dual point of view, which I felt would work well with the serial format. And I kept the chapters a lot shorter. My fantasy novels have chapters that are about 6,000 words long. And I don't think there's a chapter longer than 3,000 for Blood in the Water, which was challenging but fun to do. The other thing was that I had to make sure that each chapter was worth reading, which sounds like, oh, like as a writer, you definitely should do that in all of your books. But the truth is in the fantasy books, it's like maybe there's a scene that like in the greater context is really important. But if you made a reader wait a whole week or several days to get that chapter and then that was all that happened, they would be unsatisfied. Yes. <laughs> So there was kind of this pressure to make sure that each chapter, basically my my kind of philosophy was if I can refer to these chapters by like an event that happens in them, then I'm doing a pretty good job. So I tried to, to follow that philosophy. So there's like, oh, there's the liquor cabinet chapter, there's the storm chapter, there's the dress chapter, so that I can kind of keep them both straight in my head and know what's going out which week. And also so that, like, I know the reader has something interesting to look forward to in each chapter. Again, like you said, it's that very Penny Dreadful vibe where, like, I haven't read The String of Pearls, but I have read Varney the Vampire, supposedly by the same author, but it's a Penny Dreadful, (laughs) who can say? Right. But, um, yeah, every chapter has a title that basically spoils the full events of the chapter. (laughs) 
Mm -hmm. In (laughs) which blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Which is one of my favorite ways to title chapters, honestly. Truly. But it also does, if you're buying each chapter individually, week after week, let the reader know that they're going to get something worth their penny. It's the way that comics used to do it, too, when you'd have the cover, and it would, I saw a TikTok about this recently that was really funny, where it was a cover from a Batman comic, where Batman's yelling, die, Commissioner Gordon, and, like, holding him over this, like, gap between skyscrapers. And when you get to read the actual story, you see that he's actually, it's a, the speech bubble has been kind of chopped in half and he says if you don't move you're going to die commissioner (laughs) (laughs) oh no so that's the kind of thing that it reminds me of is like how old comic books because you're buying an issue at a time even if it's this really long overarching um (laughs) like story that has all of this intricate stuff if there is a down period you have to make it like look like it's a huge event so that people will buy it yes very much so i definitely tried to avoid that though so i did try and make sure that if there the the other thing about a romance is that sometimes the interesting thing that happens is just like a slight step forward forward in the slow burn. It doesn't have to be every week some extremely heart palpitating event. Sometimes you can get to the end and be like, oh, she looked at him finally. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> that lovely historical romance moment where a brush of ungloved hands mm. is like scandalous heart pounding. Yeah. So Blood in the Water originally had two endings, a happily ever after and the quote unquote bad ending. So what inspired you to offer multiple endings to the reader? Truthfully, it's that I couldn't pick myself. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, when I started writing it, I didn't know where I was going to end it. I always knew that it could have a good ending or a bad ending. To me, originally, the bad ending seemed like the more logical of the two. Uh, It seemed the more interesting of the two. I love a tragedy. And it also felt a little bit like, and I still feel this way about the good ending, even though that was the one the readers chose. It felt kind of like a cop out. It felt too good to be true, too convenient. But I wrote it anyway, because I had fell in love with the characters as I was writing it. And I was like, you know, I really would love to do other things with these characters. uh, And that only happens if they live. So I guess I'll write an ending where they live. And then this is a problem I have when I have to cut scenes as well, is when I write something, even with the kind of intent of, oh, we'll see where this goes, I'll have phrases or like conversations that I'm like, wow, that's really interesting and good and some of the best work I've ever done. I should totally, uh, I I need to keep this. So I wrote the bad ending first because I knew if I wrote the good ending first, I would not write the bad ending. And I liked it so much. I was like, should I even bother writing the good ending? But I did. And then I was like, oh, man. (laughs) Oh, no, I really like this one, too. And I sat with him for a while. And then I was like, well, the um, serial format gives me the ability to give readers input. I've read kind of like not webtoons, but like sometimes people do Twitter like threads that have polls in them where the um, audience chooses what happens next kind of. And I'm like, the internet has given us the unique ability to get instant feedback from our readers. So I was like, even if that many people don't read it, which was my biggest fear was that like two people were going to read the whole thing and I would have two people who would vote. And they would each vote for a different option. You'd be right back where you started. Exactly. Right back where I started. I'd have to flip a coin. Luckily, that is not what happened. I think I had a little under 20 votes total, um, which was good for what I was expecting. And it was honestly closer than I thought it would be. The bad ending had some pretty faithful fans. The good ending didn't end up winning because I think people fell in love with the characters and wanted them happy. (laughs) Oh, wow. Rude of them. How very dare. I honestly, like, come on. No one appreciates a good sad ending anymore. But yeah, that is is how it happened. I think I had like nine. I have the ratio in my acknowledgments, I think. Uh, in, in the paperback version so it's like 9 to 13 or something so yeah i will say having read both endings they are both satisfying each in their own way it just depends on whether you want more of the horror or more of the romance right that's how i feel too and especially because they're both inspired by two two of my favorite vampire medias that i've ever like consumed which are midnight mass and let the right one in oh let the right one in Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) i think you can see really blatant 
I'm not subtle about my references in this one because at the time of writing it, my thought process was I'm going to be as derivative as I want to be. I don't care if anyone can look at this and see (laughs) this is just the last last voyage of the Demeter. This is just passengers. This is just alien. This is just let the right one in or midnight mass or whatever. I'm like, I literally don't care. I'm just going to have a good time. And that came into the endings. I was like, I don't feel like... So the last Voyage of the Demeter did the Midnight Mass thing at the end as well in a way that felt, I think, I'm not going to, not to toot my own horn, but I felt like it was way more similar to Midnight Mass in the last Voyage of the Demeter than it was in mine. I at least put some distance between Court and Carmen before uh, he does what he needs to do. Yeah, I don't know. I like both of those endings for those movies a lot for different reasons. Again, because one's a romance and one's a tragedy. And so that's that's kind of where I landed where I did. I think as an enjoyer of multiple horror media, you've done a good job of distilling the elements you enjoyed and creating something new out of them that still very much has your unique voice. I hope so. And I I mean, I'm a big I'm a big horror lover. Whore. I'm a big whore lover. No. <laughs> I mean, listen, we support sex workers <laughs> We here, really do. But also... But that's not what I was trying... I love vampire media specifically very much. Um, right before recording, I was watching Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula with some friends, and I was thinking about some of the, like, homages I was able to slip into Blood in the Water, and those two endings being versions of that is really important to me. I don't know if the people who voted understood that that's what I was doing, but that's totally fine. I think that the people who voted, it was entirely down to whether or not they preferred the romance over the horror aspects, like you mentioned, which is totally fine. And it's interesting to see the kind of audience that I've attracted with this book, because the number one interesting thing that I've seen in people talking to me who have read it is that I've had a lot of people say, I don't usually read things like this. So I was a little worried was what they'll say. And I'm like, oh boy. But then a lot of them have said that they really enjoyed it. And that makes me happy, especially because like, I'm someone who struggles with genre labels like a lot. I personally think of this as a horror romance. I think that specifically the gore is maybe a little above what you would expect from a typical romance story. Rather, yes. (laughs) I would agree. But sometimes I feel like I've been so desensitized that it's a little tame. And so I don't know, like, I don't know what people are expecting when they go in. I know people who don't like horror at all have read this one. I know that people that I know who are big vampire media fans have read it. And the reception being pretty positive across the board actually surprised me. I really expected this one to be one that um, was a little more divisive. You're really bringing people together. I am. (laughs) On a boat where they can't escape. (laughs) yeah exactly it really puts you in the in the same position the characters are in which is despair (laughs) which is uh uh-oh storm's coming Uh oh great storm's coming moon's haunted (laughs) moon's haunted the sea is lousy with draculas (laughs) that said with such a delightful response to the novella can readers expect more of blood in the water in the future well as a matter of fact yes (laughs) Uh, I'm currently working on a new edition of it. When I initially wrote it, my thought was that I was just going to put it out as the serial and leave it at that. Maybe compile it into an ebook that was more cleanly edited so people could download. And then I was like, well, I already have vellum. (laughs) I've already spent several hundred dollars on this formatting software. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I'm like, I have it. It's it works. I love formatting things in vellum just for fun. And I had already made the mock-up of the cover in Canva that I was using for the Royal Road version, the serial version. And I was like, this would be pretty easy to turn into a full spread, like a, just a full paperback cover. And I was like, why not? And so that that edition is not like, I wouldn't call it slapdash because I still put a lot of effort into the formatting. I put a lot of effort into the chapter header image is one that I, I took a Canva like floral border and I used it as guidelines to turn it into a vampire border. So there's still a decent amount of effort put into it, but it was never its final form for me. I think pretty quickly after I put the paperback out, I was like, I really, really, really want a gothic romance style cover for this. 
I really, really, really want there to be illustrations. I feel like this is one of the, I bought an illustrated version of Frankenstein that I actually have right next to me. So I can tell you who, who illustrated it. It is from Barnes & Noble and it's illustrated by William O'Connor. So it's a Barnes & Noble edition. It was still there last time I checked. And I fell in love with the illustration style. They really draw the monster as just a little guy. Oh. <laughs> they have this very excellent design for him that's like ghoulish, but definitely undeniably kind of adorable. I love him very much and I love the style very much and immediately as soon as I bought that I was like man I want to illustrate something in this style. I do want to draw just a little guy. I want to draw just a little guy and luckily Court and Carmen are both just little guys in their own special way. A just little guy for just little guy romance. Exactly and it's just a little romance too. Uh <laughs> But yeah, so I have that coming out soon. I am, I keep saying I'm done with the illustrations, but as of recording, I have two more that I finished that I need to add into the um, into my file and format properly. It's really hard to stop once I start, and there are so many scenes that have yet been unillustrated that I think could still deserve something. That's going to be hardcover. It's going to have a new cover design. I did that gothic romance style cover that I had dreamed about, and I did it myself, which I'm really proud of. I had thought about getting someone else to do it. But as much as I know artists who are capable of it, I felt like my vision was kind of hard to communicate and easier done myself. So I gave it a shot and I think it turned out okay. I would concur. As an enjoyer of traditional gothic romance covers, I think you absolutely nailed it. Thank you so much. I'm at the point where I'm looking at it and being like, wow, I don't know about this. <laughs> but I get that way with all my art. The curse of looking at something you made. You literally. Oh my god. But you know, that's the... I don't know if I've told this story before, either on the podcast or just in general, but when I was in community college and taking art class, I had a professor who referred to me as a 2 by 4 student, and what that means is he wishes he could take a 2 by 4 and smack me over the head so I'd stop overworking my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that has stuck with me to this day. And I still think of that whenever I'm I want to go back to the cover. I'm like, man, looking at all of these, the clouds are so much more like they have so much more backlighting. And so I went and start fiddling with that. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> Two by four. <laughs> Two by four. You're done. <laughs> But that being said, the last thing that's in this new edition is a short story that takes place after the good ending, which is the ending that the serial readers voted on to be the, um, as Tumblr kids call them, the canon ending. So it is the one that <laughs> <laughs> I, as the author, observed to be the one that actually happened. And the bad ending is the hypothetical. Um, I am adding the bad ending back in to the hardcover edition because um, it's good and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> also, I feel like alternate endings are a good fit for special editions. I think so too. What I've done that might be controversial, and this is another tangent, is I named the ships in the endings different things. So previous to right now, I have been referring to these endings as the good ending and the bad ending. But in the actual final edition, they are called the desire ending, which is the quote unquote good ending and the prudence ending, which is the quote unquote bad ending. Because those are the names that I gave the ships. And those are the driving forces behind the decisions that the two of them are making in those chapters. So I'm hoping that it's easy enough for readers to tell which one's which when they read it and that they don't get mad at me, but they might. I didn't feel good about just putting <laughs> good ending and bad ending in, in, the <laughs> in the printed edition. Well, that's so judgmental for one thing. I... And for another, like, desire and prudence is, one, a very apt descriptor of what is going on in each ending. And two, it's just very poetical. And I do like that the names of the ships are taken into account. Thank you. I am a nerd like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, after the desire ending, I do have like a bunch of stuff that I could write with these characters that I've thought about a lot. But pretty much directly after finishing Blood in the Water proper, I had this concept of another story I wanted to tell with them that I won't, I won't even say the premise because I feel like that's already giving away too much. All right. But it's called In Cold Blood. And I decided that all of the stories that I will write with these characters after this are going to have titled after like common sayings involving blood. Hell yeah. Because <laughs> again, I'm a total dork. 
But yeah, so that one is, that one's going to be a little more, um, one warning I will give to readers who may be listening is that it will have a new point of view character. I'm, that's another thing that I'm a little worried about being a little controversial, but I think that people will probably like it because there were certain things I wasn't able to do in the novella proper that I really wanted to do, but they just would have, I had certain rules for myself regarding court that I did not want to break because to me, blood in the water Vampires always are kind of a metaphor for something. And in this case, I think a lot of it comes down to the relationship between men and women when it comes to power dynamics. So when it comes to Court's relationship with Carmen, his awareness of his power over her is really important. His decision to put that aside is really important. And I made a rule for myself that he can never entertain the thought of biting her. He can, like, have that hunger and that desire, but he can never, like... There were moments where I'd be writing and I'd be, like, in a groove and it would start to stray that way where he'd start kind of fantasizing about it. And I'm like, this is breaking his character for me. It's making him less likable. It's making the metaphor more strained. And if people were to pick up on the metaphor, it's making Court into a predator and kind of lecherous in this way. So I made a rule that he could never think about it. Carmen can think about it, but he can't. So there are no points in time where we get that kind of impulse from him. We don't get to see him drink human blood or think really hard about drinking human blood in a in that kind of way. So I am very excited to say that that is something that we do get in the additional short story. All right. Expanding his horizons we are. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's about 7,000 words and that'll be... That'll be after the good ending. And then I have other stuff that I want to do that I may never get to. But just so that everyone knows, Court, if, after Carmen dies because Court's immortal, he does get a boyfriend and they do live happily ever after. So I just want everyone, I want everyone to know that. Is this, I feel like I've read a Tumblr post in this vein. <laughs> Probably. Does Carmen keep reincarnating or am I making that up? She does. Reincarnating. Uh, <laughs> Reincarnating <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> yes, that is something that I would really love to write, but it would be a lot of work to kind of actually realize that premise, I feel like. Um, so, but I do have it like in my head. I know every like era, how she dies every time, who she reincarnates into, what their relationship is like, and all this stuff. I just don't know if that will ever be something that I have the motivation to put pen to paper about. But just know that that's in my head. I will say, in the short year of our acquaintance, I've never (laughs) known you to be at a loss for ideas for story. This is actually the problem, yes. I can see where this might fall by the wayside in the wake of everything else you're working on at the same time. Oh my god. Yes, I think there are other things that have gripped me more. And I think that as far as Court and Carmen are concerned, their story is well complete with Blood in the Water itself. But a lot of, I feel so much pressure from reviewers being like, I could read more of these characters. And I'm like, I bet you could. Oh, no. Write fanfic then. Please write fanfic (laughs) and send it to me. (laughs) You heard it here first. (laughs) Don't do that. I'll get sick with anxiety, but you can write fanfic and not send it to me. I'll be flattered by the idea of it. We're pulling a reverse Anne Rice over here. Yeah, (laughs) literally. I'd be comfortable being called um, anti-Anne Rice, like the reverse (laughs) Anne Rice, totally. Inverted Anne Rice. Inverted Anne Rice. Well, thank you for coming back to the podcast, Carolina. In the meantime, where can folks find you? Yes, you can find me on the site formerly known as Twitter. I'm active there in spite of everything. God knows how long I will last, but you can find me at Nina Wolverina there or on Instagram under the same username at Nina Wolverina. Those are the two places I am the most active. Other than that, yeah, you can find me here sometimes on this podcast. I'm looking forward to having you back on the podcast again soon. I'm looking forward to being here soon. Excellent. 